The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. Jesus said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Well, on behalf of Bishop Pedro Suarez and all the congregations in the Florida Bahama Synod, I say thank you. Thank you so much for this incredible opportunity to get to be with you here in worship today. Unfortunately, as Pastor Alicia said, I am going to have to do what I hope none of you ever do, which is take communion and leave. <laughs> However, this is the only weekend until July that I could be here both on Saturday and Sunday, and so we thought that that would be amenable instead of waiting all the way until July. So thank you very much. Um, when I told our Bishop Pedro Suarez that I was going to be here today, he said, oh, that's such a wonderful congregation. And he wanted to give you his love. You know, he was here not that long ago last summer for Pastor Alicia's ordination and installation. Um, I was here too, by the way. Um, I was just a plain old pastor in those days. Now I'm just a plain old pastor that drives a lot. Um, but he wanted to thank you for being a part of this network of over 160 congregations with four additional congregations in development. He wants you to know that you are a part of a network that includes retirement communities. It includes campus ministry on our college campuses, and it includes outdoor ministries and camping opportunities for all ages. It includes glo ugh, global ministry and one of the most world-renowned disaster response organizations, Lutheran's Disaster Response. So thank you, because those things only happen due to the generosity of this and our sister congregations. Thank you. I also know a few things about you. I served as a parish pastor just down the road in Vero Beach. I've known your pastor and the few that have come before and handful of retired pastors. I've known them for a, quite a while as we were colleagues in ministry. In fact, the first time I came to Advent, I think, was to the Melbourne Beach campus, something like <clears throat> 20 years ago, um, because you, we hosted a retreat there that you invited other congregations to. Um, and these are some things that I know about you. I know that you have an incredible food pantry every Thursday. Serve, I, I don't remember the number of people, this, it's enough, it's a lot. Um, how many of you are involved in the food pantry or have donated food or been there on a Thursday? How many of you? I am amazed. It has been two-thirds of every service. So it is truly a ministry that I can see is owned by this congregation. I also know, and I was really excited to be here because I know that you have excellent music and worship. Amen? Amen? Every week I knew it and I was so excited to get to be here for myself. I know that even though this congregation has been through some transitions, it has never held you down or slowed you down from your commitment to sharing the gospel with the community. 
Even now, there are Bible studies that are happening. There are uh, community outreach. There are lots of wonderful things that are happening. And you know the other thing I know about you? I know you have a really great pastor. Amen? Amen. And I know that you're looking to find another one because that's part of the way I've been in relationship with you. But I have one last question I'd like to ask you all. If you would share with me by show of hands, how many of you have been at Advent for two years or less? Anyone? Pastor Alicia and the choir. Oh, a few. How about uh, two to five years? Couple. How about five to ten? Okay. Ten to fifteen? Uh, fifteen to twenty? Twenty to thirty? Thirty-one to forty? Anyone here from the very beginning in 1982? You were here at Pastor Needler's installation. That, you get it, Pastor. Very good. That's awesome. So I love to get to see, um, so thank you for sharing that with me, because I love in our congregations to see how God has changed us through, the t through time and how, what a different variety of gifts we have in each of these seasons. And my last question for this was, how was your Easter? Was it awesome? Yeah. I have no idea what that means. I really missed something, didn't I? I have only been in this role uh, for six months. So this was my first Easter in a really long time where I sat out there in the pews where you all are sitting and where I didn't know every single detail of what was going to be happening in worship. I didn't know how many Easter lilies we'd ordered or what hymns we were going to sing. And I got to come through the doors on Easter morning and experience the surprise that you all get to feel. Easter always has a bit of a magical feeling to it, doesn't it? And so our gospel lesson today, while Easter for us was three weeks ago, our gospel lesson today actually is still taking place on Easter Sunday. So in order to fully understand today's gospel, I think we need to unpack it a little bit. You know, first, there's Friday. Well, we could go to Thursday, but I only have so much time to get to preach. So let's say first is Friday, and we encounter Jesus hanging on the cross. And his disciples and his friends know what has happened, and they know that he has been humiliated and suffered a punishing death at the hand of the government. So they truly are fearful that they would die a death like his. And so they kind of gather up together in locked doors. And a few of those disciples, they, they go, um, and, and so then it's been a couple of days, and now it's Sunday morning, and the sun is starting to rise, and the women get up to do the work that they were unable to do on Friday, which is to tend to his body. And they get up and they go to the tomb. And Luke's gospel tells us that they meet two men in sparkling white who ask them the question, why are you looking for the living among the dead? What emotions do you think those women were feeling? Shout it out for me. Scared? Apprehensive. Apprehensive. Very nice. Lots of syllables. What else? What else were they feeling? Fear. Fear. Confused? Yeah. We saw him. We saw him come into this tomb dead. And he's gone. And I bet their fear is not just like that there's angels standing here, but are we going to get blamed for this? So, of course, the women rush back. They go tell the other disciples, and the men didn't believe them. <laughs> Tale as old as time. And the men didn't believe them. And so Peter, I think, wanted to prove them wrong. And he rushes off and runs to the tomb. And he, too, finds it empty, but doesn't get the blessing of angels. And they gather back now on Sunday, on that Easter Sunday, and all the joy and exuberance and trumpet and organ that we felt on Sunday, they instead are left with fear and terri terrified. I don't know. They're, they're terrified. And probably still anxious and apprehensive and maybe even a little bit hopeful. 
We're given a glimpse of what they're feeling because two of those disciples start to make the long seven-mile trek home, and we're told that they're hanging their heads with sorrow. And someone comes and joins their journey to Emmaus. Do you know who it was? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus comes and accompanies them on the journey, and they say, don't you know what's happened? And so Jesus explains things to them, and once they get seven miles down the road, we're told that it's, it's probably dusk, it's almost dark, and they implore him, friend, don't keep on, but come and stay with us, it's getting dark. They go in, and in the breaking of the bread, they identify, as Jesus gives thanks, these disciples, Cleopas and his companion, identify that this is Jesus. And they ask the questions, weren't our hearts burning within us the whole time? So Cleopas and his companion get up. They run seven miles back to Jerusalem. They've got to tell what it is. We're told they leave the same hour. And I don't know how long it took, but I know I'm really, really happy I can run a 36-minute 5K. And if we're talking like, say, uh, 11, 12K, we're looking between an hour and an hour and a half that they have hustled, gotten back to the disciples. Can't you just picture them? <gasps> we saw Jesus. And I have to think the emotions in the room, maybe the confusion is greater, but maybe the hope is growing a little stronger and the excitement is real. And the part of, of the verse that we didn't read today begins with, while they were still discussing these things, Cleopas and his companion standing in the room out of breath, all of these disciples together, we've got Peter's story, we've got Mary, Joanna and Mary's story, and all of this confusion and chaos and still fear for their lives and into that feeling Jesus comes and stands among them can you hear him say those four wonderful words peace be with you in my vocation as pastor I've had the blessing of accompanying many families in those final days and hours, and in those days and hours after a deep loss. And so often in that space, you know when it's kind of confusing and you start talking about the person in both the past tense and the present tense, when you can't even believe that they're gone, and you Folks will sometimes tell me about their loved one and describe them. Oh, he loves to do. He loved to do. Well, we always go. Every single year, we did. And somewhere in that deep, deep grief, Jesus Christ himself, fully alive, comes in and says, peace be with you. In fact, I think he comes into when we experience that grief, that is the peace that God shares with us. In fact, that's the peace that we shared with each other at the beginning of service, saying those words, peace of Christ be with you. It's more than just saying, howdy, friend, I've missed you. How are you doing? Are you new here? It's deeper than a handshake. It's taking that Easter peace that we're told passes all understanding and sharing it with one another. I could probably stop right there, but I've planned a couple of other words, if you'll humor me. You see, everything had changed. And those disciples could hardly understand that the one who was dead is now risen, but he isn't going to physically be with us forever. He's going to ascend to the Father and, and send us out in a way that maybe we've never been commissioned before. And everything is changing. And in the midst of that, 
Jesus doesn't wait for the answers, but the questions, but instead gives them the answer. He says, here, touch my wounds. See, touch my side. It is I. It is I whom you saw crucified. But we're told that the disciples thought Jesus was a ghost. And so, I love that Jesus doesn't even wait for the question, but instead, he looks at his dear friends and says, Mmm, I'm hungry. Y'all got something to eat? That's how we said it in Jacksonville, where I grew up. I'm not sure what they said in first century Palestine. But he asks them for something to eat, and they give him some broiled fish. And like some incredible thing, Jesus has wounds and yet eats fish, and it doesn't just like fall through to the floor. In the midst of everything changing, the disciples were seeking to know what is the real thing. And it's like Jesus answers their questions before they're even asked. I know that right now for Advent Lutheran Church, this is a season where it feels like things are changing again. And so I pray that God would continue to answer those questions. And I can tell you, friends, you are in excellent hands. Pastor Alicia, who has committed to stay with you and love you through this process, Jerry and a council, and and soon there'll be a call committee of leaders who are devoted to helping you through this next season of life. And I hope that you hear from my heart that I love you and we pray for you. And we can't wait to meet your next pastor too. As I reflected on this gospel this week, And the fact that in the midst of this turmoil, in the midst of this change, Jesus seems to be committed to showing what is the real thing. I had the craziest thing just sticking in my head all week long. I was drawn to the 1970s ad campaign for Coca-Cola, where they proclaimed themselves, Coca-Cola, it's the real thing. Now, if I'm honest with you, I was born a decade too late. I don't know what really happened in the 60s and 70s. Some of you were there, I presume? So tell me, what was happening in the United States in the 60s and 70s? Vietnam War. Civil unrest. It was pretty all-encompassing, wasn't it? Everything started changing. Women started burning things. Men started growing their hair out long. You know, everything was kind of crazy, as the documentaries show me. In the Vietnam era, did we as a country trust our government? No, we didn't. For good reason, right? We felt like things were being held from us And they were. And you know, right after this ad came out, the next thing that happened, Watergate. In the midst of a country feeling unrest and mistrust and everything changing, the brilliant marketers at Coca-Cola decided that even though they were going to change their recipe a little bit, that what people were craving was to know what was real. Isn't that brilliant? Everything feels like you can't trust it. And Coca-Cola says, no, our drink, it's the real thing. I mean, this is back when we're telling people to smoke for their health and drink soda for their health. It's the real thing. You know what they did with that ad campaign next? Then the next ad campaign, they put a whole bunch of hippies on a mountaintop and they sang a song. I'd like to buy the world a... Y'all don't remember? Lori heard it last night. She has to answer. (laughs) I'd like to buy the world a Coke, which became a song by the Hilltop Singers with a slightly different phrase. Do you remember? I'd like to teach the world to... 
in perfect harmony. They went so far as to take the real thing and to say that this was going to lead us to living in harmony. Well, friends, I think they were right and they were wrong. Because the marketing executives at Coca-Cola, they didn't know what the real thing was. They didn't know who the real thing is. The real thing not only walks through doors scarred and worse for wear and bringing hope, but the real thing comes to us every time we gather, offers his own body and blood to feed us as we go out into the world. We get to take the real thing with us. Our first lesson today talks about the fact that there are things that we don't know, but beloved, what we do know is that we are children of God. You know, at the last service, precious Penelope Brooks was washed in the waters of baptism, and she too joined us as a child of God. Our gospel today says that you are witnesses to these things. You see, bearing witness to the majesty of God is not something just that Pastor Alicia and I get to do as pastors. It's a gift that we all get to share in, and we are strengthened for this gift by Jesus' very self. And as we bear witness in the world, this is where I think they got it right. I think that by teaching the world to sing in perfect harmony, well, in that way, we are bearing the gospel of Christ to the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our hymn of the day. Thank you. 